I like to start off this story by saying that you're always better safe than sorry. I listen to horror stories all the time, but I never thought that I would be sharing my own. For privacy reasons, I will be changing the names in my story. My name is Jessica and I'm 15. I would like to think that I'm a very cautious person. I live in Ireland in a big suburban neighborhood. I usually like to go on walks almost every day. It's nice to go outside every once in a while during this pandemic. It started off like any typical day. I got up at around 8 a.m., went to get some coffee, did some workouts before school. Around this time, a snowstorm was approaching my country, so it was very cold outside, and it got dark around 5 p.m. After I got done with an exhausting day of school, I went down to go watch some TV in my living room. Shortly after, I got bored and decided to go on a walk. It was snowing outside, and it looked really nice for a walk. When I left my house, I didn't bring my dog with me. He could be quite annoying to walk at times, and I just wanted to enjoy myself. As I was walking down a long stretch of sidewalk, it was about 4.30pm at this point, and it was starting to get dark. I'm the type of person who's very perceptive, and also paranoid. I think it's good to be a little paranoid sometimes, as it could possibly save you in certain situations. I look up to see this man walking past me. I've seen this man around my village before, and he's always given me the creeps. I always get this weird vibe whenever he's around. Other times when I've walked past him, he stares daggers at me with an unsettling grin on his face. I don't want to be too judgmental, but I think that he may have something wrong with him. So as he walks past me, I keep my head down to avoid eye contact, but I can see from the corner of my eye that he is staring at me. I keep walking, but I suddenly had an urge to turn around. As I did, I saw him just looking at me. It made me feel extremely uncomfortable. To describe this man, he is about six feet tall, looks to be in his mid-forties, his hair was in a tight man bun, and he always seemed to be wearing the same clothes, jeans and a flannel shirt with dirty shoes. My heart started beating fast, so I turned back around and continued walking. Over the next ten minutes, I could feel him watching me, which meant that he was most likely following me as well. I turned around again to confirm my worst fears. There he was, still staring me down like some kind of creepy statue at a Halloween store. We made eye contact for about five seconds before I felt my fight-or-flight instinct kick in. My mind scrambled, trying to figure out what to do. He was only a few meters behind me and closing in. I came to a junction and waited for the light to give me the signal to cross the road. There weren't many streetlights on this road, which made me feel even more uncomfortable. While I was waiting there, I heard the man walking closer to me. I was hoping that he would just pass by me, but that wasn't the case. Hey there. I turned around to face him and just gave him an awkward smile without saying a word. As I crossed the road, he kept close behind me. Hey, hey there, he said again. I offered a quick response. Uh, hi. I spoke in a strong voice, without sounding too eager to talk to him. I kept on my way, but he followed me and continued the conversation. Um, I'm trying to get rid of phones in my house. I'm trying to sell them off. Would you be interested in buying one? As soon as he said that, I knew that I was in danger. This man wasn't going to leave me alone, and I knew he was lying. I may be young, but I'm not that stupid, so I just said, uh, No thank you. You have a nice day. And I kept walking. He continued to follow closely behind. I was now thinking about how unfortunate it was that my phone was broken, and therefore I couldn't contact anyone for help. So, I began to internally panic. I turned a corner, and I noticed that there were no people or cars, 
It was then that I decided to make a break for it. I didn't look back. I just counted down in my head. Three. Two. One. Run. I soon realized that I had made the correct decision when I heard the pounding of footsteps close behind me. I knew I shouldn't have, but I looked behind me one last time as I ran. The lighting wasn't the best, but I could clearly see that he was holding a large kitchen knife in one hand. I was so scared that my heart was practically beating out of my chest. I felt sick, but I had to think fast. The man was gaining on me. We were running through my village at this point, and I could see some bystanders in the distance. That's when the unthinkable happened. I felt a cold object strike my back. After a few more steps, I could feel my blood make its way down my spine. That's not a figure of speech either. This lunatic had stabbed me. I staggered a bit, but I kept running even though I was badly injured and bleeding. Fortunately for me, there was a small police station just across the road from my neighborhood. Knowing that this was a life or death situation, I sped towards the police outpost. Once I got to the entryway, I looked back to see the man running in the opposite direction. I ran inside, completely hysterical. Two police officers immediately came to my aid. One of them called an ambulance, while the other applied pressure to my wound. I frantically told them about the man and tried to explain what happened. The ambulance arrived and took me to the hospital. I was in shock and so overwhelmed by the whole situation. None of it felt real. Fortunately, the stab wound wasn't that deep and I have since made a full recovery. I gave a detailed description of the man and mentioned that I had seen him around before. He must have fled somewhere far away because to my knowledge, they never caught him. That was the very last time I ever took a walk by myself. Just to clarify, I'm a 22 year old female, but at the time, I was only 14. I was in middle school, and I had made some plans to hang out with some friends at the town's park. It was probably around 5 p.m., but it was such a long time ago that I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is. The town I lived in was very small. You could drive right through it within about a minute and it was gone. I used to walk around everywhere, to the store, to the school, and to the park. I lived only a couple blocks from there, and I didn't have a cell phone back in those days. I messaged my friends on the computer and told them that I would be heading that way after I fixed my hair. They told me that they would be heading that way as well. I tell my mom that I'm going to hang out with my friends, and was in a hurry as she shouted at me to come home before dark, since I still had homework I had to do. It was bright, sunny, and the weather was nice. I walked a little ways, and right before I got to the park gate, a white truck stopped at a nearby stop sign. The driver was a man in a white shirt and a baseball cap. He looked to be in his late 30s to early 40s. He looked over at me. I give him a small, awkward smile and a little wave. He smiles back at me and waves before continuing to drive up the road and pulls into the sonic drive-in that was just up the street. I didn't think much of it at the time and entered the park alone. Scanning the area, I didn't see my friends, so I found shade under a tree by the swings. It was a couple of feet away from a gazebo. I didn't understand why the park was completely empty. Our park was always full of kids and families, but there was nothing. It was quiet and empty. I waited patiently for my friends to arrive, just daydreaming under the trees. That's when I hear a vehicle pull into the small parking lot. I look up and I see that it's the same white truck from before, and the same man steps out. He's holding a bag of fast food as he makes his way to the gazebo, only a couple of feet away from where I'm at and the entire time he's staring me down. It was the kind of stare that made your skin crawl, unblinking and relenting. I had an immediate gut feeling that something was wrong, and my skin began to itch. He didn't take his eyes off me for a second, not even when he was tearing into his meal. I spent a while fiddling with my bracelets, and praying to God that my friends would arrive soon. I looked over at him again. He nodded, 
and then motioned for me to come over. He did this repeatedly. I shook my head and tried to keep my eyes off him, but I was starting to become scared, thinking that he may come over to me. I kept glancing over at him, and every time I did, I was met with the same unrelenting stare. Twenty minutes had passed since he arrived, and my friends were nowhere in sight. I began to get this feeling that they weren't coming. I was alone in a park with a creepy man who was much taller, bigger, and stronger than me. These thoughts flooded my brain, and that's when I noticed that we weren't alone. There was a girl with long brown hair sitting by the slides. She was a couple of feet from my left. She looked only a bit older than me. She called me over, and I felt a lot safer coming up to her than I did that creep sitting over by the gazebo. As I approached her, she asked me if that man sitting over by the gazebo was my dad. I couldn't contain my fear any longer, and started frantically explaining to her that the man was not my dad, and that he was really creeping me out. I could sense that she felt a bad vibe from the situation, just as a bystander, seeing the way the man was looking at me, as if I was a piece of meat. I told her that I was only 14, and that I was supposed to meet some friends at the park, but they didn't show. I then mentioned to her that the man had motioned for me to come over to him several times. She told me that she had just got off work and was waiting for a ride from a friend who lived pretty far away. She had been watching us both for some time, feeling that something was off. I thanked her for calling out to me and was relieved to have someone with me. She sat there with me and kept an eye on the man. We made casual conversation about school and other stuff. This went on for about 15 minutes. All the while, the both of us kept constantly checking to see if the man was still there. He was, and was still staring daggers at me. He wasn't eating anymore. He was just sitting there and staring. I was so uncomfortable, shifting my position every time I noticed him. My face was hot, and I was feeling sick to my stomach. I glanced over again to see him motion once more for me to come over. I could see his eyes light up, and his smile becoming wide. The girl gets irritated by this. I watched her stand up quickly and stop down the steps and walks over to the gazebo. From where I was on the slides, I could see them talking loudly back and forth. I was able to make out the guy saying, That little bitch led me on. He repeated this over and over again, saying that I was some kind of slut that led him on, saying that he never would have tried to get me over to him if he had known that I was a kid. I was a tiny thing. There is no way that anyone would have mistaken me for an adult. She came back and told me that I should head home, and she would keep an eye on him as I left the park. And since I lived pretty close, I would have to make the trip home fast, so he wouldn't see what street I lived on. I bolted out of the park as fast as I could. As I did, I could hear a vehicle's engine rev up. I saw the white truck peeling out of the parking lot and turn onto the same street that I was on. At that point, I knew the man was following me. I saw the truck begin to pick up speed. That's when I ran between the two houses just off to my left. I then hid behind some thick bushes. I got low so I could still see what was happening in the street. The truck stopped in front of the alleyway, and I could see the man sticking his head out of the window, presumably looking for me. I then heard a female voice yell, Hey, what the hell are you doing? The man shouted back, Hey, I told you to mind your own business. If I ever see you or that little bitch again, you're dead. You hear me? You're dead. The man revved up his engine and drove off. I ran home as fast as I could. When I got through the door, tears began to burn my eyes, and I broke down sobbing. I told my family what happened. We all went back up to the park sometime later, but the man and the truck were gone. A couple of days later, I found out my cousin went to work at the same drive-in that the man had been at. She heard a crazy story from her co-worker about how they had saved a little girl's life from a pedophile at the park. Like I said, our town was really small. I found out her name was Cheyenne, and to this day I'm so grateful that she was there to protect me. She was my guardian angel that day. I don't know what would have happened to me if she had not been there, and the thought of me being stuffed into that guy's truck keeps me awake at night.
I would like to remain anonymous for reasons that will become obvious. This happened about five years ago, when I was 16. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I was an asshole back then. Me and my friends were a bunch of idiots who robbed, sold dope, and partied like rock stars. The area that we were in shall remain nameless, but I will say it was in Canada. One day, I went to this guy's house. Let's just say he was a friend of a friend. He wanted to buy some electronics off me that I had recently come into possession of. We'll call this guy Mike. Now, Mike was this fat white dude, I would say, in his late 30s. I knew all about Mike because of his reputation. He was constantly in and out of prisons for various reasons, mostly drug-related and assault charges. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Why the hell would I be associating with a dangerous guy like this? The answer is about what you would expect. I was just a young, stupid kid. I went into his house with a friend because I needed help loading the stuff inside, and I also needed to show him that everything was working properly. Mike asked, How much? I gave him a price. I can't recall the exact amount I was asking for, but he obviously didn't like what he heard. I'm not paying that much, kid. 400 is the best you're gonna do. We argued back and forth for a little while, until my friend chimed in. Hey, fat ass, quit f***ing us around and give us our money, or you can go f*** yourself. Mike then grabbed a chrome handgun out of the cushion of his couch and pointed it at us. He cocked the hammer back and shouted, Okay then, get the f*** out of my house, you little bastards. We left and took the merchandise with us. We drove off laughing about the whole thing. Inside, I was losing my cool because I had just had a gun in my face. After we hid the merchandise, I headed home. Later that night, I went to a house party with my girlfriend and spent some time drinking and smoking weed until my girlfriend wanted me to take her home. We were both pretty intoxicated when we started walking back to her place. Along the way, we had to stop so she could take her shoes off. That's when I heard from behind me, Surprise! Then a loud bang. I grabbed my girlfriend and ducked down behind a car as more shots rang out. That's when I realized that my girlfriend had been shot in the chest. She was still alive, but was going into shock. I put my hand over her wound and kept telling her that it was going to be alright. The shooter made his way around the car, and that's when I saw that it was Mike. There was a second gunman with a sawed-off shotgun with a bandana around his face directly behind him. Mike ripped my girlfriend away from me and pointed the gun at my face. I begged and pleaded with him. Mike, dude, she's got nothing to do with this. Let her go. <laughs> Damn shame, kid. She's cute. He aimed his gun at her head and... <laughs> anger completely overtook me. I charged at him screaming... But before I could do anything, I was hit in the back of the head by the man with a shotgun. And Mike turned his gun on me and said, Your turn. By stroke of luck, a few of my friends came out of nowhere and began shooting at them. I stayed down, and when the shooting stopped, they were gone. The next few hours are a blur to me. I vaguely remember talking to the cops and somebody telling my girlfriend's family what happened. I can only imagine how crushing it must have been for them. I was eventually released, and as soon as I got back home, I took a nosedive straight into a bottle of whiskey until I passed out. A few days later, the police caught up with Mike and his asshole friend. After that whole ordeal, it made me start reevaluating my life. I'm a much different person today. And it's a good thing, too, because most of the people I knew back then are either dead or in prison. My name is Alice, and I had a terrifying experience with my little sister when I was about 9 or 10 years old. My family and I lived in a small housing community that had two schools. 
My town's junior high school was less than a mile from the edge of the last row of houses. Across the street was the elementary school and a park. This experience happened just outside of the junior high school building. There was a bunch of old concrete slabs that were dumped there to be later disposed of. My sister and I were jumping and playing on these concrete slabs and our bikes were laid out by some other debris. I noticed a dark green or maybe black Saturn coupe. It drove slowly down the street before screeching its tires. The driver then turned the car in our direction. As soon as I noticed this, even in my young mind, it was really suspicious to me. I made it obvious that I noticed them, hoping that they would just go to the skate park that was down the street. I didn't panic my sister too much just yet, until I saw the car slowly approaching us. Now my sister and I are very used to that area, and we play there all the time. We always rode our bikes along that strip of sidewalk in front of the school, and that vehicle was pretty much staying alongside that sidewalk. I started thinking about where we could go to get back home safely, and I told my sister to stop playing and get on her bike. I remember telling her that the vehicle was suspicious, and they may not have good intentions. I knew I couldn't defend my sister from some grown man if it came down to it. We had our bike stolen before, so I kind of thought that's what they were after. As we got back on our bikes, I saw the car begin to pick up speed as it made its way towards us. I was attending the elementary school that was just up the street, and it was the only place I could think of to go. Since it was obvious at this point that whoever was in the car was definitely after us, my sister and I were pretty fast at riding our bikes, so I told my sister to pedal as fast as she possibly could. We got to the elementary school in the nick of time. The car pulled in after us as we stopped in the middle of the parking lot. My heart almost stopped when I first looked at the parking lot and saw that there was only one car left. It was one of my teachers, and he was packing up his vehicle. This is what I was counting on, that there would be a teacher left on campus or maybe a security guard. The car noticed that there was a teacher behind us, and they drove past slowly with the window rolled down. I remember trying to identify a face, but I only caught a glimpse of the driver's arm as they sped away. I looked at my sister and back at that teacher. I silently thanked him. I knew a way around the back of the elementary school. It led to an apartment area, which we could go through to get home. My sister doesn't remember feeling traumatized after that incident, but I remember lying in bed trying to sleep, so distraught over what happened and how scared I was. I didn't tell my parents until I literally became sick from holding it in. It's never a good idea to bottle these kinds of things up. My mother didn't really seem too concerned over what happened. But let's just say that things were different for my family back in those days. And we'll leave it at that. My lesson learned was to always trust when you feel something isn't right. And if I didn't take that situation seriously, me and my sister probably would have ended up on a milk carton. I used to work at a fast food restaurant that primarily serves chicken and is closed on Sundays. Its employees are also known for saying, my pleasure. I'm sure you can guess what restaurant I'm talking about. Most of the time, I really loved my job. At one point, I even wanted to work at the corporate office in Georgia. But there was one incident while I was working there that really unnerved me, and it still freaks me out thinking back on it. At the end of the night, I always had to clean the bathrooms, mop the floors, wash the dustpans, and hang them up along with the brooms. Then I would have to take out the garbage to the dumpster out back. Then I was free to go. So I had finished all my cleaning duties, and all I had left to do was take out the trash. It was around 10.50 p.m. I was really tired and ready to go home. It had been a long work day. I had been there since 2.30, and my boyfriend, who works in the kitchen said he wanted to grab a bite to eat on the way back home. I told myself to take care of things quickly so we could get out of there as fast as possible. There were three trash bags, so I figured I would take two trips. I would take two on the first trip and one on the second. This restaurant has a policy where people are supposed to take out the trash in teams of two, but the managers and myself figured that it wasn't really a big deal. We live in a suburb about 40 miles from Los Angeles. Nothing really happened around here, and it was common for us to take out the trash alone. I walked to the dumpster with the two bags. When I got there, I heard a small noise. It was a rustling sound. I stayed quiet, 
figuring that I would hear the noise again, but all was silent. I tossed the bags in the dumpster, and as I walked away, I thought I heard the noise again. I hoped that it wasn't a rat or something, not that I was afraid of them, but no restaurant wants those things around. I went back inside and grabbed the last bag. I took it to the dumpster again. I then heard another noise. It was as if someone was rummaging. I threw the bag in the dumpster and decided that I would investigate. If it was a rat, then we would have to set traps in the morning. I grabbed my phone from my back pocket and used it as a flashlight. I went around the dumpster to look behind it. What I saw was much, much worse than a rodent. Behind the dumpster was a hooded figure. They appeared to be on their knees holding what looked like a dead animal carcass. Perhaps a rat or a dead bird. I could hear a disgusting wet crunching sound coming from the figure. I gasped and jumped back. The figure's head instantly looked towards me. It lowered its meal, and as it did, a piece of animal flesh fell out of its mouth. From where I was standing, I couldn't see the person's face, but I could certainly hear their deep, raspy voice as they said, My, you're so beautiful. I wonder how good you taste. Without a second thought, I turned around and ran to the restaurant. My boyfriend was at the front counter, clocking out for the night. I ran to him and tried to tell him what happened, but I was hysterical and started to cry. My manager came up from the front office and I eventually told him what happened. The two of them ran out and tried to catch the guy, but they were too late. There was no one behind the dumpster area. And unfortunately, there was also no security cameras back there, so there wasn't much we could do besides call 911 and warn them of a creepy, possibly cracked out homeless man who was running around eating roadkill. After that incident, the restaurant got very strict about having people go out in teams of two to take out the garbage. Even in the daylight, surveillance cameras were also installed. I still worked in the same restaurant some time after that, but ended up leaving for reasons unrelated to this incident. Ever since that night, I'm much more cautious about my surroundings, especially when I'm by myself. In September of 2020, a 20-year-old Australian university student posted a harrowing personal account to the popular social media site, Reddit. In it, she detailed the terrifying ordeal she'd been subjected to after posting intimate pictures of herself on a social media page known as OnlyFans one involving obsessive stalking, internet loopholes, and ultimately, a clear and present threat to her life. Only through a completely anonymous throwaway account did she feel safe enough to share her story, adding that her local police force had finally taken action against the person responsible. But even then, the girl made it clear that her complaints should have been taken seriously long before she was in any imminent danger. According to the girl, the incidents all started after she moved back with her parents during the summer break. The girl was particularly excited to be home as the family had just bought a new puppy. By all accounts, the girl was having a ball getting to know her new furry friend. But as anyone who's ever had a puppy will tell you, to say they can be erratic would be the understatement of the century. One night, the girl awoke to hear her puppy yelping at the back door. They were in the middle of potty training, but... The pup didn't quite have the hang of it yet, so she climbed out of bed, put on her slippers, and went downstairs to let the dog out. She says it was as late as 2am, and there didn't seem to be another soul around as she stepped down into the night, but she soon found that she wasn't entirely alone. I saw this figure in a car, she said. I could tell they were looking at me, but it was pitch black outside, and I couldn't make out their face. I felt a bit uneasy but I didn't really think anything of it, only when I go back inside the car started up and followed me up my driveway. The terror of such an experience is undeniable, and even though the girl was so close to home, there's no denying that being out alone in the middle of the night made her very vulnerable indeed. I was terrified, the girl added. I sprinted back inside and locked the door, and kept an eye out for them in case they tried to break in but as far as I know, they just backed out of our driveway and left. When she woke up the following morning, after a terrible night of restless sleep and deep concern, the girl found an envelope inside her parents' letterbox. 
the envelope contained not only 20 Australian dollars in cash, but also her OnlyFans username. I thought long and hard about how he could have found my parents' address, the girl said, and I worked out that the problems didn't start until I shared my Amazon wish list. OnlyFans and Amazon were both adamant that their security systems prevent leaks like that from taking place. However, it appeared that wasn't the issue, as third-party sellers are not bound to the same data protection laws as large multinational companies. Although she doesn't know for certain how her stalker got her address, the girl is 90% sure that they got in touch with a third-party seller and obtained her home address in that way. Whether it was money, coercion, or intimidation that caused the seller to give up the info is another question entirely, but the fact remains that it's the most likely of all explanations. After that, when I moved back to the college town where I was studying, I stopped posting content, the girl goes on to explain. But somehow my stalker still managed to track me down. The girl said she basically closed down her OnlyFans account, then started a YouTube account because of how unsafe the former felt. Her first big blogging project was due to be a shopping trip to a local mall, but when she got to her car to depart for the day, she found it had been ransacked. The vlogging camera was missing too, she said. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in the car, but I was using it the night before and since I lived in a gated area, I didn't think I would be unsafe. Yet she added that the camera was inside of her glove box and contained an SD card with unreleased photos and videos on it. It was almost like someone knew it was there, but as bad as that was, it only got weirder from there. She eventually contacted her building security personnel, asking if they could review security camera footage from the previous few nights, and it was through this that not only did she see a man break into her car and ignore other cars in the parking lot, but she also had proof she was being deliberately singled out for targeted harassment. After they got the camera, they walked around the duplex until stopping near my window, the girl wrote. My bedroom faces an outside street and the blinds are broken so it's very easy to see in. I have a curtain, but it doesn't cover my window all the way. Look, what I'm trying to say is, this person watched me sleep for an hour or so. I have no idea why they didn't try to break in, but thank God they didn't. The woman explained her camera was later recovered at a nearby secondhand store, suggesting whoever is stalking her has a prior history of criminality. However, she added that the camera's memory card was missing. I know he kept it as some kind of trophy, I just know it, she added, and has since moved and hopes her stalker hasn't followed. I believe the police are still trying to track them down, but I have broken my lease and moved to a new place, so hopefully this will keep me safe. But what's so scary about the girl's story is that it seems like only a matter of time before the stalker decides to take things further. Unless they're caught, stalkers will only ever escalate their activities until their obsession reaches a deadly and permanent end.